Welcome to this Jungian life. Three good friends and Jungian analysts, Lisa Marciano, Deborah Stewart, and Joseph Lee, invite you to join them for an intimate and honest conversation that brings a psychological perspective to important issues of the day. I'm Lisa Marciano, and I'm a Jungian analyst in Philadelphia. I'm Joseph Lee, and I'm a Jungian analyst in Virginia Beach, Virginia. I'm Deborah Stewart, a Jungian analyst on Cape Cod. Today we're going to explore the intersection of skin and psyche, and exploring the skin not just as our largest organ, but as a psychophysical symbol. Skin is a vast communication network, and it betrays our ego that often wants to appear in control, so we often feel uncomfortably seen when we flush with embarrassment or go white when we're afraid or we suddenly sweat when we're on a first date. (laughs) It also (laughs) parades through our common metaphors. Something is skin deep, thick skin, thin skin, getting under my skin, saved my skin. (laughs) I got skin in the game, skinning a cat. It's kind of all over the place, like our skin. And it's more than a physical barrier protecting us from the external environment. It also represents a boundary between our inner selves and the outer world, and skin can communicate all kinds of psychic tensions, from basic defenses to complexes. It's an interface between our psychological selves and the outer world. Mm -hmm. And so we're going to talk about skin. (laughs) Well, maybe I'll I'll start off with this uh, kind of famous psychoanalytic observation that Freud said that the first ego is a body ego, Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. meaning that our physical embodiment provides the first sense of self that we have as we're a, a baby who's becoming conscious of being a sort of separate human Uh, Mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's our, it's our body and in particular our skin Mm -hmm. that lets us know, well, this is where I begin and, and, uh, you end or vice versa. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, the skin is so sensitive in that respect that, uh, skin contact between mother and baby actually it regulates the infant's temperature. Mm. Uh, it, 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 there's so much to that of what that baby feels. And we can't keep our hands off a baby. <laughs> or should we? Oh, ex- absolutely. Uh, we want to hold them. Uh, we want to make eye contact. We want to caress them. We celebrate all those little toes. Mm -hmm. Um, So I think there's much in that uh, that Freud said and that humans have known for millennia. Uh, Mothers hold their babies. We have baby carriers, uh, slings, etc. We want that baby's skin close in contact. Right, skin to skin, Mm. as we say, a symbol of intimacy. Mm. So there are all the realities of what skin is as an organ. It does all kinds of Mm. important things. Cools us, keeps us warm. It vents various things. It takes in things. Skin actually creates or helps create vitamin D through the way the oils on the skin interact with the sunlight. Incredibly complicated and Mm -hmm. wonderful. But in that analytic tradition, we are taking the symbolic attitude because the unconscious perceives everything from that symbolic or metaphoric level. So we're interested in what it might mean or how to conceptualize skin, and we've 
already started by talking about the ego skin as a kind of protective barrier, the boundary between the self and the external world, and the starting point for developing an ego that eventually is capable mm -hmm. of thinking mm -hmm. and representing. And depending on how our skin is engaged, that can affect some of that foundational sense memories. So if the skin is understimulated, we're not mm -hmm. touched or we're neglected. Mm -hmm. And this is something that it had an absolutely catastrophic effect on children that were raised in orphanages. You know, or kids that were in incubators, for that matter. Mm -hmm. um, they're getting changed, bathed. No one's tickling them, stroking them, uh, letting them sleep on mm -hmm. mom's breast for hours at a time. Mm -hmm. And the lack of those memories of contact often leaves, at the very least, this field of anxiety, frustration, and rage. Well, it's not just that. Those babies that are not touched will suffer from failure to thrive. They will literally stop growing. Wow. Yes. And uh, we know that, um, you know, contact with an infant helps the myelinization process of the nerves. Mm. That, ki that kind of like physical contact with the baby is necessary for normal physiological growth and development. So it's not even just psychological. It's just yeah. really. So global. Yeah. yeah. And what has to come, where it has to come from and what has to be a part of it, and we all know this all the way into adulthood, is touch is love. Uh, you know, we could, you know, sort of say, well, then every baby in an orphanage, you know, needs to be massaged once a day. So we assign somebody to do that. And I doubt that that would accomplish anything really substantive. We are relational creatures. Touch is how we first perceive a relationship. And just as you said, Lisa, where I stop and start and you begin, uh, from our infancy where we need to be touched and soothed, stroked, bathed, changed, uh, to puberty when we discover sex, mm -hmm. uh, the erotic components of touch. Uh, and so it goes through our whole lives. Uh, we need touch, and it is uh, one of the main ways we communicate. Care, love, you are desired, you are precious. I want to touch you. And we could make the play on words there of the pun between when we're touched emotionally mm -hmm. and, of course, it's related to physical touch. One way to imagine that is when we are touching, and particularly the touch is positive because not all touch is, depending on mm, how that. that happens. But when the touch is positive, it's as if there is only one skin. So when the infant is lying on the mother, she's stroking and touching, there is an experience of a unified skin, which gives the baby the sense of being in that Ouroboric place, mm -hmm. of being one being. Inversely, it's not uncommon for lovers who want to surround each other. Mm -hmm. And part of that is the feeling of one skin, that we are in a single container, and there's something so relieving. Often when lovers meet after a separation, they'll hold each other, and then there's often a sigh. A, oh, mm -hmm. That happens as yeah. something in the nervous system just lets down mm -hmm. in this shared container. Yeah. So we're talking about skin, Joseph, you're talking about this experience of the kind of collapse of boundaries, but in a sense, skin is such an important boundary. Mm -hmm. It's a boundary against disease and infection, mm -hmm. but it, it's also a, a good metaphor for a psychological boundary. Mm -hmm. You know, this, this sense of 
uh, being a distinct individual. And uh, of course, you know, one of the ways that we can think about some psychopathology is poor boundaries. So mm-hmm. skin becomes an important image, I think. Um, there, there is a well-known book by the psychoanalyst Didier Anzieux called The Skin Ego, in which he talks about this, about the skin's role as, as a mm-hmm. boundary that uh, demarcates um, our individuality and the importance of that psychologically. The, 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 it can feel beautiful to merge, as you were just describing, yes. mm-hmm. but merger can also be the source of psychopathology. Um, Mm -hmm. You know, one of the things that comes up for me is Jung, I think, made this very important observation about the the nature of the ego. In Jung's formulation of the psyche, the ego is that which deals with everything coming from the world outside. So, you know, the ego is kind of the conscious I. It's when you say Mm -hmm. I, you're talking about your ego. So, you know, you have to figure out... um, how to get to work uh, and avoid the bad traffic. Uh, you have to figure out, you know, how you're going to prioritize uh, your the tasks on your desk that morning. You've got to field a phone call from your sister who's really upset. These are all ego things, <laughs> different different levels. You have to remember to, um, you know, call your spouse because maybe she's having a bad day and you want to want to sort of mm-hmm. offer that support. But the ego also has to feel things coming from the inner world. So Mm -hmm. there might be dreams, there might be moods or feelings or impulses or instincts or intuitions that the ego has to figure out what to do with. So the ego is that organ which relates both to the inside and the outside world. And it seems to me that that's also maybe a pretty good description Mm -hmm. of skin. So I'm liking this idea about the skin ego. And by the way, we'll, we'll um, link to that book in the show notes too. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So the metaphor of like, when somebody doesn't have a lot of skin, they're kind of bleeding all over the place, mm-hmm. meaning that their feelings, their mm-hmm. thoughts, their inner content is being verbalized all the time in the mm-hmm. environment. And yeah. they need to be able to hold, hold the stuff inside of themselves a little longer. So I'll, I'll offer an example that you just made me think of. So when I had um, my, my kids, both times I had C-section. So my skin mm. was literally cut open. And, you know, I brought this beautiful little baby home and both of my children were <laughs> exceptionally beautiful babies. <laughs> Of so, course they were. Uh, absolutely. <laughs> and and I felt so raw. I mean, I think a lot of women relate to this, like the postpartum period, you feel unbelievably emotionally raw. You cry very easily. Feelings feel very, very big. You feel very, um, uh, and, and I remember thinking, you know, sort of like as a psychological metaphor, it's like, I feel like they forgot to sew me up. It's like, I, you know, it's sort of like, I, I, I felt like, emotionally no one had sewn up that scar and and the, my skin wasn't there to keep my insights from just trailing out mm-hmm. you know yeah because it was such an, a feeling of emotional vulnerability so the the way that skin skin helps us keep what should be inside inside to be thin skinned uh or to feel raw mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, or t- to feel at times mm-hmm. like I've just been skinned and there is no, there is no boundary. Yep. But I'm liking the idea of the skin as it, it mediates. It's not just a boundary the way that um, a fence is a boundary. Right. Uh, it has its own aliveness. It... Uh, it communicates all kinds of things that we've just touched on of whether how we feel and our emotions. It helps us be aware of our emotions. It insists on our being aware of emotions, uh, that we, we blush or we feel guilty or we sweat or we have goosebumps. Um, so it's a very communicative uh, element of, of mediating ourselves to ourselves, 
as well as ourselves to the external world or the external world communicating things to us. It's, it's too cold in here. Mm -hmm. uh, I need to go get a, a sweater. Or, you know, um, yeah, my boss just came in and I was playing a game online and I turn red. Uh, so, uh, you know, the boss might pick up on that. But, but also, I can be aware of, of how, what I was doing, and it doesn't align with my internal values. I, something says this isn't quite right. Um, I love the aliveness of, of skin uh, and that we are these naked animals. Mm -hmm. You know, we go out and we, we love all the pelts that, that other animals ha have. Um, no, we don't have one. Um, because it is alive and vibrating and reacting uh, to the external world and to our internal world. Mm -hmm. uh, independently, I might add, mm -hmm. it's not as if I can just decide that I'm not going to turn red when uh, my boss catches me having a little time out on my laptop, mm. uh, it just tells us what we need to know. It's yeah, like so, the unconscious. Yeah. Uh, it has its own direction and, yes. and energy. And, you know, skin is our lar largest organ, and I'm assuming evolutionarily, although mm -hmm. maybe some uh, evolutionary biologists will um, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but I'm assuming it's also the oldest like in terms of our sensations, the ability to smell, see, taste, hear, uh, evolved after, I'm assuming, the, <laughs> the kind of ability to, to feel touch or, or to touch something or, to, or to, to have that kind of sensation. So, and, and Deb, I, I really like your, um, your point about uh, how it communicates. I'm, I'm thinking about the way that octopuses, you can sort of, see almost see their thoughts because their skin will change like if they suddenly uh, see a crab they'll they'll just color will just blush all over them because they're like yum a crab and if they get scared <laughs> that you know and, and it's i think they have if i'm not mistaken about this i think one of some of the evidence that octopuses dream and we think they do comes from the fact that mm. while they're sleeping there are these skin changes. Yes. So we're not quite as expressive as octopuses, but I know that when I'm sitting with an analizand, I will notice um, patches of redness that appear on a person's neck mm -hmm. or, or cheeks or heightened color. And, and I, can, I can see the, the, the heightened, af heightened feeling, I don't say affect, that occurs as you know as we shift topics. So uh, you're absolutely right that it's a it's a it's a real communicator, and there's mm. a direct connection with the unconscious. I remember someone making the point at at some moment in our training that skin diseases, in particular, uh, tended to be often very psychoidal. That is in this uh, very mysterious mm. realm between the psyche and the body, that the skin would reveal emotional truths that we might not even have a lock on yet. Uh, just uh -huh. to, to backstep just for a second in terms of the profundity of skin, that um, apparently we receive about 11 million bits of sensory data per second Oh. Although the <laughs> conscious mind or the brain can only process about 400 of the bits, mm -hmm. mostly it's from the eyes, but the skin apparently provides a thousand bits of sensory information per second. Wow. Uh, excuse me, a million bits of sensory information per second. It's enormous. Mm -hmm. um, and because I used to be a body worker and, and a... Mm -hmm. uh, an Alexander Technique teacher dealing with movement, the proprioceptive part of skin has an enormous effect on how we orient to the environment, which is going to bring us back to ego as well, mm. and how incredibly difficult it is 
when people develop neuropathy and part of their skin yeah. can no longer mm -hmm. communicate. Yeah. Uh, I have a little bit of idiopathic neuropathy in my feet and my hands. And uh, as I'm aging, I'll, I'll drop things and I, I won't notice it mm. because I'm not getting enough sensory information or how difficult it can be to even just take a step if your feet, the skin on your feet is not communicating adequate information mm. about balance and what's happening between the body and the environment, the mm -hmm. ego has to be able to add in all kinds of information as well as certain yeah. reflexes that don't kick in mm -hmm. when the skin doesn't tell the body what's happening between itself and the outer environment. So that just goes uh, again to our, the scientific reality that our skin does an enormous job at orienting us to the world, mm -hmm. just as you were saying that the ego mm -hmm. orients us to the world and that the ego needs that information from the skin. Mm -hmm. Absent that, the ego has a much harder time. Mm -hmm. We were transitioning into more of the symbolic level. At least I know you were beginning to do that. No, but that's uh, that's fascinating and and really helpful, Joseph. So the skin as a medium or a canvas that expresses mm. what's happening inside of the psyche and how that we might, I don't know, mm -hmm. think about that. Mm -hmm. I love the idea of uh, when you say the skin is a canvas, it takes me to what do we do with our skin mm -hmm. uh, from skincare products. And uh, I didn't look up or even try to look up how many billions of dollars a year we spend on various products, makeup, and uh, what, when we have tattoos or in some cultures, scarification, piercing. Uh, that is very much the skin as a canvas, uh, how I can do, uh, kids do face painting um, at various events, and they can come out looking like cats or something else, and they delight in it. And we go out and spend money on makeup. People get tattoos. Uh, the skin is our canvas uh, for us to be creative with and uh, to make ourselves beautiful. Mm -hmm. So skin what, can be part of persona. Is. Yes, ah, it can right. be used as persona, although yeah. it really is much more profound than that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And why it can be such a powerful thing for somebody to decide, I'm not going to wear makeup anymore, mm -hmm. that I'm going to let the environment see the real me rather than change uh, how I appear the decision as to whether or not we'll get plastic surgery or other conditions mm -hmm. has to do with tending persona, which is not a negative thing, but that persona is carried in the skin, as you were mm -hmm. saying, Deb, in really significant ways. But what I'd like to have fun with for a minute is talking about the various things that we want to put on the skin. I was thinking <laughs> about mud masks mm -hmm. and, and is putting mud on the face representative of wanting to return to some primal earthy element have <laughs> maybe an engagement I, with that. But, <laughs> why not you know but it but it's also about perfection so a lot of times the the masks promise to minimize your pores mm -hmm. so there's this sense that we should almost be porcelain mm -hmm. without without these kind of disfiguring pores and uh, so, so the masks are for cleanliness and maybe purification. Um, so, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I think there's lots of ways to play around with that. And rubbing lotion. <laughs> How many times, you know, sometimes people feel that, well, I've got to put lotion on, and there's a, an ego reason for it, but also it's a way of ritualizing, touching, and yeah. caressing my yes. body. Mm -hmm. Yeah in a way that can be really as important as whether or not the skin is moist. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it can, it can be a way of um, just, just honoring your, your own body, kind of yes. tending to your body. There can be, a, I think you're right, Joseph, a kind of 
ritualized, kind of sacralized aspect mm-hmm. to that. It, it, and skin does need care. I mean, a lot of yeah. people, you know, with dry skin or um, aging skin. Um, mm-hmm. what, what, what are you talking about, Deb? Well, it just is just a concept, <laughs> of course. <laughs> Nothing that I have any personal experience with. Um, of dry skin is is a factor, oily skin, skin breakouts, um, and we have, you know, heaven knows how many products available to correct what we perceive uh, as needs and flaws, uh, some of them very real, at uh, one end of the spectrum, and then the other end of the spectrum is beauty, mm-hmm. uh, that I will apply these other products uh, to my skin. Uh, to be more beautiful, which goes back to what you were talking about, Joseph, of persona. But that's the first thing we see uh, is persona. When someone walks in the door, we meet someone, we see someone we know, is we see that presentation, and that's usually facial. And how do we enhance that presentation to evoke a positive reaction from the other person, Mm -hmm. and to feel good about ourselves. I want to also lift up that the ingredients in the elixirs (laughs) have an enormous effect on the psyche. Yes. and, and, And pull us towards or away from certain things because the skin is very absorptive. You put things on the skin and it gets taken in through that. Yes. So... I remember there was a time when having placenta added to shampoo or to creams, it's true. Uh, But that was quite an evocation. Whether or not it had any actual uh, benefit to the skin, but why were so many people drawn to the idea that the placenta, which is this that connects us to the mother, the great mother, Right. That that's going to be a good thing and that I need that. So I need to apply that. Yes. Mm-hmm. Uh, and that's, it's so symbolic. Exactly. Of yeah. uh, that if you have this, you know, something that goes right back to our origins of this mm-hmm. mysterious, magical thing, the placenta, uh, that must um, have an effect. And a lot of that, as the beauty industry knows very, mm-hmm. very well, uh, is symbolic. Exactly. Uh, you know, it doesn't do the same thing to say, guess what? You know, this product has uh, grapefruit skin in it. We would kind of go, eh, I don't think so. Uh, but some mm-hmm. other things are magical ingredients that will make us, that will transform us. I remember in the uh, early 1900s, people were uh, at that point fascinated with mummies, and they were grinding up mummies and adding powder to mm. all kinds of things. That's, yeah, because then you would somehow have a relationship to the mummy cream, mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. and all of that, of course, has symbolic equivalence to it. And then there's a way in which we're projecting something onto the placenta, mm. the mummy. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Maybe the endless number of things that are added often in minuscule amounts just so that it can be listed as an ingredient mm-hmm. so that we can then think, oh, yes, that, I'm taking that in, or that, right. that is somehow going to enhance and make things better. Right, and we, we can take things in through our skin. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So that's, that's, mm-hmm. It's an organ of... Uh, incorporation in some sense, different from eating, of course. But it, it is a way that we can become identified with any of these qualities by, ta- by putting it on our skin, by rubbing it in, by letting it be absorbed. So I think you're right. I think there's a rich, symbolic field here created in all of this marketing for these, uh, mm-hmm. you know, unguents. Uh- um, the things that go in and having uh, having a facial and being mm-hmm. tended to, mm-hmm. and all the magical products go on your face, and mm-hmm. oh, we come out and uh, we've been rejuvenated, we've been mm-hmm. made beautiful, we've been made more whole. Uh, 
uh, all kinds of of things, especially um, when someone else is is doing these processes of of beautification, and, and the list is pretty pretty substantial uh, of of being tattooed, being mm-hmm. having your uh, having a mask applied, having your eyebrows shaped. Uh, Venus's beauty box, right? Venus's beauty box, and having that touch from someone else uh, who is real, who is paying attention and tending to us in a physiological way. Uh, having you know, a massage. Mm. Yeah, I, I'm mm. thinking about. We've talked about the body as canvas, and we've talked about you know mm-hmm. changing your skin to look more beautiful. But I, I think it's a, a pretty um, ancient part of warfare to paint the skin or disguise the skin in some way to look more fierce. I think cultures, mm-hmm. I'm not an expert on this by any means, but I think it's very common in different cultures to uh, put different paint on the face, for example, you know, war paint. To, to signify that you're, you're ferocious and you're something other than human. And, and even to the point where, you know, football players will oh. uh, kind of, uh, will, which, which has a practical application, but, but I think it also communicates something of the same thing. Uh, a- absolutely. Uh, mm. uh, especially when games are played in stadiums, the, you know, at night, it's just sort of like, you know, it's it is war paint, um, and the other end of that, of course, is is makeup, and you know, and other beauty things that we change our our surface. Uh, you know, we haven't talked about exfoliation, which is another really <laughs> big one, and um, we and I have to link this with um, the shedding of skin, the snakes do. Which has mm-hmm. been, you know, symbolic uh, in around the world for millennia, that the shedding of the skin and shedding, you know, all the old dead skin cells that we uh, do have and supposedly have of what are we exfoliating? What are we shedding? Mm-hmm. Right. Uh, what are we sloughing off. What are mm-hmm. we sloughing off and uh, to be new to be. Mm-hmm. Newborn to be, you know, are we shedding uh, old attitudes? Are we shedding a mood? Are we shedding limitations? Um, I feel younger. I feel more vibrant. Are we shedding illusions? Mm. So those are things that the ego can become interested in and to act upon the skin in a way that is highly symbolic, just as you're saying, mm-hmm. but the ego is often feeling like this is a good thing to do. I've heard mm-hmm. about this. <laughs> yeah. I'm going to scrub my skin and buy that loofah sponge that I saw advertised uh, as a new Hey, product. I have one of those. <laughs> I remember when that just suddenly get started advertising everywhere that yes. I, could, uh, I could find. But let's, let's turn a little bit to a more purely symbolic piece, and particularly things that happen to the skin that we can't control, yeah. which are also um, transitional diseases of the skin or things that happen to the skin. And one of the ways I think analysts can think about this is, well, what if I had a dream and I saw a figure who had this manifestation mm-hmm. on their skin? How might I symbolize that? So for instance, I'm thinking, that I were to meet somebody in a dream and that I noticed they were bleeding from their skin. You know, I might think that, you know, where am I psychologically wounded right now? Mm-hmm. That something external has come against the psyche and, and I am bleeding and perhaps I'm not aware of it. So the dream maker then sends an image the bleeding one, so that I can then ask that question, where is my unacknowledged bleeding? 
because it doesn't seem to be treated or it doesn't seem to be stopping on its own. Hmm. You know, when we think about the symbolic messages that the unconscious sends us and might it send us such messages through our skin, Mm -hmm. I do think that skin is one of the places where the psyche can really talk to us, whether Mm -hmm. it's, as we've been talking about, maybe blushing, but even, you know, that maybe there's a mysterious... um, a mysterious rash, you know, an, mm-hmm. an unknown, an itching of unknown origin, a swelling or a discoloration or a roughness. And we go to the doctor and the doctor runs a full panel of tests and says, I have no idea. Yeah. yeah. You know, I think we have to be careful in always assuming that, that every single physical ailment has a kind of, you know, kind of psychological core to it. Mm-hmm. I don't know that I believe that it does. I think sometimes, you know, it's, it just is something physiological and full stop. However, I think that skin is one of the places where mysterious things happen. I, I don't know if the dermatologists listening would agree with me. And, and that sometimes it might be useful to ask, what is Psyche trying to tell me mm-hmm. through these hives? or through this mysterious blistering, mm-hmm. or, uh, you know, whatever other um, strange uh, phenomenon might be happening on our skin. I was looking at some of the writings by a, a physician and psychoanalyst named Jorge Olnick, mm. and he conducted this really interesting work where he had teamed up with dermatologists, huh. uh, and for a time a patient would meet the dermatologist and this, the psychoanalyst together at the same consult. And depending on what the patient started with, so if the patient started with talking about psychological distress, the first consult would be with the analyst. If they started talking about this as a purely physical phenomena, then they would meet with the dermatologist first. And that the psyche would kind of declare Mm. where the tension might be. And as you said, sometimes it's something that can be managed physically, although I would venture to say that nothing that happens in the body is purely physical because the psyche Mm -hmm. is always internalizing a representation of everything Mm -hmm. that's happening. What we might be asking is where's the causal agent? And perhaps the causal Mm -hmm. agent could be Mm -hmm. external but the psyche is still turning it into a psychic event. Sure, yes. Regardless. So I like this idea of taking a psychological attitude, even if we're not sure that it has emerged from psychological conflict. Mm -hmm. That said, the analysts have really created a certain library of thoughts Mm. about certain disorders of the skin and how one might orient to that. And so I thought we would uh, toss some of those things out and see if there's anything interesting in any of that. So let's talk about psoriasis, (laughs) which is, you know, really substantive problem for people. So one psychoanalytic attitude is that the responsibility and burden that somebody is carrying can be symbolized by these plaques of skin. Mm. And that as the skin is kind of peeling off, that can symbolize a sense of divided loyalties Hmm. Hmm. and where that shows up on the body and suggest where this might be relevant in the psyche, particularly connected to the history of what has happened on in those body areas. Hmm. So with psoriasis and eczema, often the dermis, the skin is growing too quickly. And so it's throwing off 
the superficial layers of the skin, which is revealing unformed skin mm-hmm. cells, mm-hmm. consequently are not prepared to be exposed to air and touch and other things. Mm. So they look kind of red and raw, but they're not raw because anything has been done to them. They're raw because they came out into the world prematurely. Mm. So that's an yeah. interesting psychological process. And we might ask, as well as, of course, treating the symptom compassionately, mm-hmm. where, where do you feel forced to come forward prematurely? Mm-hmm. And was mm-hmm. that part of the, mm-hmm. the childhood? We could imagine that if you were raised by parents that had a lot of idealized fantasies on a child, they might force the child to be precocious, to have to do things before they're ready, mm-hmm. because the parent needs the child to carry some sense of superiority or talent that the child may not be ready to evidence or to bring forward that's internalized as a pattern. There's an idea that the skin could reveal that as a tendency Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. in the psyche. Our Patreon has had a makeover. There's lots of new content and ways to engage with us. Patrons who support us at the $5 level and up will now access Young Love, weekly bonus episodes where the three of us discuss dreams and questions sent in by supporters. At the $10 level, you can vote on topics for podcast episodes and vote on which guests we invite. And at the $25 level, you'll also be able to watch behind-the-scenes content and even join us for occasional live events. If you'd like to be a part of all this, the link to our Patreon is in the show notes. Thank you so much for your support. We couldn't do it without you. So another area that the psychoanalysts were really interested in was scratching. Mm. And they often were curious about whether it is fueled by anxiety or stress, Mm. and that the physical act of scratching is a manifestation of attempting to relieve an internal or psychological Mm. conflict. The other thing which is interesting about scratching is that the scratching increases the desire often to scratch more. Mm Yeah. Which, from a psychological standpoint, one would think, oh, the body wants something, yeah. and then I meet the need, and there should be a sense of satisfaction. Like, I'm thirsty, I drink water, I'm not thirsty. Scratching is very complicated because you're meeting a need, uh-huh. but it leads to a more arousal. Uh-huh. So for the Freudians, sometimes scratching was thought of as an erotic experience, <laughs> and it can feel erotic. Oh, my goodness. If you're itchy and somebody yeah, scratches it and you're like, oh, <laughs> oh my God, that's so great. I mean, don't tell me that's not erotic. Yeah, <laughs> that's, yeah. It's incredibly yeah. sensuous to scratch mm-hmm. that itch. Mm-hmm. Uh, and in, it can be very anxiety relieving for people that have skin picking disorders, mm-hmm. um, hair pulling disorders. Uh, there's something about uh, that kind of repeated uh, behavior where the problem is that it's a palliative. Mm-hmm. It's satisfying for the moment, mm-hmm. but it, as you said, it doesn't satisfy. It's, it, it leads to the urge to more, which would you know, make us curious about what's re- what else is going on uh, under the skin, mm-hmm. what's get what's mm-hmm. getting under your skin? Right, and so we might then be curious: mm-hmm. Are there anxieties that I am not attending to for yeah. one reason or another? Another thing that analysts were curious about were skin lesions that would just emerge, and mm-hmm. they often thought that the lesion was an unconscious cry for help or attention so that the physical symptom was seeking to make suffering visible Mm -hmm. and indisputable to the others around them. Mm. And they felt that that was often due to feelings of being misunderstood or neglected. Yeah. Yeah. 
That's that's interesting. I mean, I, I'm even thinking in in those terms, Joseph. You you have me thinking of the stigmata, yeah, which oh. is another sort of like making visible of something. It's a different something, mm-hmm. but um, you know, making visible, uh, you know, that we've been sort of wounded by God, as it were. Mm. And it shows up on the skin, but yeah, that's mm-hmm. fair. That's interesting, and I've no doubt that there are times when that's what happens when mm-hmm. when the skin reveals uh, reveals a wound mm-hmm. that has only been suffered internally. Yeah, I think you know where I'm going with this is to be uh, curious about these things that our, our skin makes obvious. Uh, to ourselves and sometimes to others, there's a problem here. It's it it's not mm-hmm. as if it's you know some uh, internal pain. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's right there on the surface. Pay attention. Mm-hmm. Do something about it. Help me with it. Mm-hmm. Uh, and there is a relationship, as we've already discussed, between. What's inside and what's outside, there's a relationship between stress and all kinds of uh, physiological problems that lower our immune response mm-hmm. or, or jack it up beyond what's needed. Uh, so I think really these are ways where we can be curious about what, what is going on besides, oh, gee whiz, I have a skin problem. Right. Um, mm-hmm. I need to see a dermatologist, which I totally support. Of course, of course. And is that the end of it? Because very yeah, yeah. few very few things are only one thing. Right. Exactly. Right. So often what we can be curious about is what is the demand mm-hmm. that the symptom is making upon us? Yeah. Mm-hmm. And how might that demand be a symbolic gesture that the psyche actually needs? So for instance, one of the things that treats psoriasis is to expose the skin to sunlight. Uh. That's a very interesting symbolic thing. Psoriasis is making a demand to be exposed to the light of day. Mm. I mean, Mm. we could go a lot of places. Mm -hmm. Other things demand creams, or sometimes the doctor says, take that off, you need to expose the wound to air. It needs to be uncovered in order to heal. There's another strange paradox that some chronic skin conditions have been integrated into the psychic functioning as a way of stabilizing the psyche so that there is a single consistent need that the ego can tend to to create a sense of continuity particularly in a life mm-hmm. where there was no continuity and no structural element to help the young psyche stabilize so that I become the one with a stable skin condition mm-hmm. so that I always need to take care of something. Right, mm-hmm. kind of gives a focus. Gives a purpose structure. and a yeah. focus. So I, I think we've done a good job just mm-hmm. pointing the direction Yeah, that skin is an incredibly interesting a canvas. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it is. And with that, I think we'll switch to a dream. And before we switch to a dream, I just want to remind all of our listeners about Dream School. If you would like to learn to work with your dreams the way you hear us working with dreams on the podcast, we invite you to take a look at Dream School. It's our 12 month online program. And uh, you get audio modules, uh, recommended readings, opportunity to practice with dreams, a lively community, and Every month, each one of us, me, Deb, and Joseph, do a live event. So you get more of us if, you, uh, if that's what you care to have. So. <laughs> that was a marvelously <laughs> ambivalent. <laughs> if you want, yeah. if you can tolerate if you, if you us, join it. Dream School. <laughs> that's right. There you go. I, I'm, I, um, I'm, not, I'm, I'm not a natural at the marketing thing. So. <laughs> That was great. (laughs) 
today's dreamer is a, a man who's 23 years old and he is a student. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, Let me start again. <laughs> <laughs> no, let don't take that out. Let's just keep going. <laughs> oh, okay. All right. He's a student of robotics and engineering, and the title of the dream is The mm. Red World. I'm walking through a labyrinth in the dark. I'm feeling my way along old cobblestone walls until a woman carrying a torch finds me. The woman is someone I knew once. We were friends until I was callous towards her in an argument and we stopped talking. When she found me, I was filled with guilt and I apologized to her. She replied, all was forgiven. She took my hand and guided me through the labyrinth. (laughs) We eventually reach a staircase going to the surface. We walk out into the light and we look upon a barren red landscape like the surface of Mars. She moves out and I follow, but when I look up to my right and the sky is overshadowed by a massive planet, as though Jupiter sat right above my head, it stretched across the horizon. I tried to avert my eyes and my friend kept calling out to me that we needed to walk, but I was stumbling and falling. I was nauseated to the point of vomiting. She kept calling out for me, but I fell face first into the dirt waking from the dream. Wow. Uh, and so here are some, here's some context. And he notes, I was in the start of my last year of my undergraduate, and I was applying to join a team for my senior project. At the time, I was overwhelmed and alone. I barely left home and was doing terribly academically. He says, the main feelings in the dream, a persistent searching when I was alone, a mixture of guilt and wonderment when I was with her, shattering awe and nausea when I was under the world. And for associations, he notes, the woman is someone I knew. We were friends once. We stopped talking after she asked for help with homework, and I callously rebuked her for not studying. Mm. So super interesting, dramatic kind of cinemograph, cinem. Movie like <laughs> cinematic. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I like cinemographic though. I'm sure that in some Just Victorian adding. world, that's what it was called. You know. Just adding in some extra <laughs> syn- syllables there. I go for it. <laughs> so I have I have immediate thoughts. Yeah, yeah. But I don't. I don't. I, it seems it. like I often start. You want me to start? Yeah, yeah. Well, first of all. Uh, it's a lovely image of anima, isn't it? Yes. Kind of mm-hmm. classic. This is exactly what we think about. She is the classic psychopomp. She is the guide of souls. She's leading him out of the dark labyrinth mm-hmm. and up to the world above. And she's urging him on, but he, he can't quite deal with it. I also note, of course, that um, you know he, he says he was doing terribly academically when he had this dream. And this is... Uh, the woman that he said, oh, you should have studied. You shouldn't ask me for help. So in a way, I, I would, in Freudian terms, I would say that, you know, I believe that this young man probably has a very harsh super ego, mm-hmm. you know, so, or, 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 you know, we might, we might think about that as a kind of, uh, a little bit of a kind of persecutory complex in more Jungian terms. It's kind of, you know, you, you, you should be doing better. But meanwhile, here's this soft part of him, this kind of feminine aspect of him um, that he was harsh to. And now she's saying, no, all is forgiven. And even though I needed to ask you for help with the homework, I know the way out. <laughs> so it's access to a different kind of knowledge. So I, I yeah. I, I couldn't help but think about um, the myth of the Minotaur. Mm. Uh, that I oh, think yeah, yeah. almost everybody's familiar with. Uh, there was a monster down there, and um, Theseus, the hero, had help from Ariadne. Because you can get into a labyrinth, but you can't get out. So Ariadne gave him oh, a ball yeah, of thread yeah. to unroll so that he could follow the thread uh, on, on the way out, and it was dark. Um, It's always dark uh, in a labyrinth or confusing uh, Mm -hmm. at any rate. So here's a woman, his, the Ariadne figure um, in this dream has a torch. Uh, 
And is forgiving, is loving, and Ariadne is a a classic example of of the anima of generosity, uh, help that is substantive that he uh, is concretized as the ball of thread. Here it's the torch. He needs that mm-hmm. um, consciousness. What's interesting is that they get to the staircase, they go up to the surface. So here he is, we're out of the labyrinth at last. But what is it, a barren red landscape uh, like like Mars with this looming planet like Jupiter uh, right right above their heads? And once on the surface, that's where he really can't can't cope. He falls. Mm-hmm. He stumbles. Um, she says, come on, let's walk. But the dream ego can't do it. And in the myth, uh, Theseus abandons Ariadne. He mm-hmm. has the contact with her. Uh, she helps him. And he, he needs to get the heck out of there after that. And he um, somehow forgets about her and leaves her on the shore. And in this dream, it's the anima who goes on, and our would-be Theseus, uh, mm-hmm. dream ego, uh, who who cannot walk. What I'm looking at um, is a little bit different, although I think we're all speaking to the same mm-hmm. thing. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. Is on one level, it's a dream about premature emergence, that the dream ego is in the womb, in the dark labyrinth, and the ego is sure that he needs to leave Mm. the container. And then when he leaves the container, he finds that like a baby, he's not even ready to walk. Mm -hmm. What's happening in the outside world is enormous, and he is so tiny. And he finds himself kind of vomiting and crawling on the ground like a baby cheesing and Mm. crawling on the ground. So this is an ego that is not orienting successfully to the need to remain in a formative place in the brooding, gestating darkness. In that regard, the feminine figure is providing, I think, a corrective lesson in the inner world, in the hopes that maybe he can internalize this and make a better decision in the outer world. So the anima, psyche, is, you're so sure that it's time to launch? Mm -hmm. So sure that you're well-formulated, that you've got everything figured out? Let's just take a walk outside of the womb and see what that's like for you. It's Mm -hmm. overwhelming. It's too big. uh, There's not enough support. It's barren. Well, because when we're in a very young place, we expect the world to be lush and to provide all kinds of things for us. But the world isn't going to provide as much for you as you think it should. And you're going to have to walk on your own two feet. And the ego is suddenly um, mm-hmm. struck with the fact that I, <laughs> I'm not ready to walk on my own two feet yet. So I think that there's a, a corrective lesson here that it's okay to slow down. You may need more time to orient and to take the next step than perhaps the world thinks, or perhaps that your heroic ego thinks. You might need some more time to slow down. That's one possible interpretation. I, I, I'm not sure, though, because she, the, the anima, is the one who leads him to the surface. So mm-hmm. I, I don't know. I, I just, I'm not, I, I'm, I'll just sort of let that hang there for a minute. But I, mm-hmm. I do want to say I'd be curious about this young man's relationship with his father. Mm-hmm. Because we have a vast reference to Jupiter. So it's kind of the world of the father. Jupiter, of course, is the uh, was the Roman god that corresponded with Zeus. So this is the, the mm. kind of the great father god. 
And it is experienced as incredibly oppressive, almost weighing down on the dreamer. Yeah, looming. And looming. And and what I what I make up, the story I make up is that this young man was very much in the in the phase where he did have to get out. He was in his last year of undergraduate. He was applying for something. He was not doing well in school at that point. Having a you know two kids in college, I know that you know the beginning of your senior year, and even I remember this. It's kind of scary. It's like, holy shit, I'm going to be done with this soon, and then what am I going to do? Mm-hmm. You know. So perhaps he was at that point. In other words, he it was time to engage the world of the father, and it was completely overwhelming. And I and I wonder about the fact that the dream seems to take place on Mars, mm-hmm. who of course is the god of, of war. war. Yeah. So I'm, you know, there's a lot of, it seems like we're finding a lot of kind of mythological references to this as an incredibly archetypal dream. Uh, yeah. Mars is the red planet. Uh, it's barren. And uh, I think a lot of what you've said is, uh, you know, holds true of that uh, emerging and where are you in a barren planet uh, with, uh, which is the god of war. Do you have to battle the world? Do you have to battle your your way, find a way uh, in an awful landscape here? Uh, do you need to have a warlike attitude? And um, I appreciate you uh, associating Jupiter with Zeus uh, and, and the father. Uh, and the lack of continued connection with the anima figure that might soften this. Mm-hmm. Uh, he falls. Um, and I think, uh, you know, graduation from college can feel premature. Uh, I wasn't ready. <laughs> mm-hmm. Please let me stay in the arms of the alma mater, the, mm-hmm. the all mother. Yeah. Uh, I liked mm-hmm. it there. Are there other courses I'd really like to take? (laughs) Another thing that I'd like to suggest in terms of the anima teaching him a lesson, I don't think the anima is is so much being benevolent in the way that she can sometimes be, but more that there's something that the ego needs to learn Mm -hmm. and Mm -hmm. that the learning is painful. Yep. So in the dream... When I compare the dream to how he treated his friend. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So the woman in the dream had asked for help in a class, and he rebuked her for not studying. Mm -hmm. And now he feels guilty about it. But I think that the crime, so to speak, Mm -hmm. the infraction that the woman held was not that she hadn't studied, is that she had the audacity to ask for help. Yes. Yeah, yeah that's right. Because what happens in the dream is that he is failing and he never asks for help. Nowhere in the dream does the ego actually say, help me. Mm-hmm. But the soul comes in, escorts him to the surface, although he didn't ask for it, and then when he's stumbling, it's not permitted yeah. for him to cry out and ask for help. Yeah. And I think that's giving us information about what he couldn't tolerate from his friend, mm-hmm. is that she asked for help. And I bet coming back to the parental curiosity, yeah. mm-hmm. I wonder if it was okay to ask for help or if yeah. something really yeah. unpleasant or worse happened. When he did ask for help, or, so the you know, or lesson is, be like Mars, you know, or yeah. you get rebuked. Mm-hmm. You ask for yep. help, and the household rebukes you for doing that for, mm-hmm. for speaking what you need. Yeah, you know, this goes to your idea, Joseph, about the premature launching mm-hmm. uh, into the world. That sometimes uh, we're prematurely uh, asked to be independent and Mm self-sufficient and uh, confident and make our way alone. And, you you know, you you shouldn't need help. You're a big boy now or a big girl. Mm -hmm. 
And um, that uh, that's what happened when his friend asked for help. Uh, mm-hmm. It struck that complex of yeah. it must be your own fault for not studying. Exactly. Yep. And uh, then he can't ask for help. Yeah. And and the anima do, is not there in a way helping him. She just says, "We need to walk." Yeah. So dependency needs were, or, or maybe something that Dreamer was struggling with. Yeah. Walk before you run. Yep. <laughs> All right. Thanks for listening. To submit a dream, suggest an episode topic, or join our mailing list, visit our website thisunionlife.com. If you enjoyed this episode, give us five stars and a good review on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. Subscribe to our YouTube channel and make sure to click the notification bell to be alerted whenever we upload new videos. And keep up with all things TJL by following us on Instagram, Facebook, X, and TikTok.